Vou chamar agora de volta ao palco Maria Elisa Costa e os mediadores Karen Stein e André Correia do Lago. Karen Stein é escritora e consultora de arquitetura, professora do Programa de Crítica de Design da Escola de Artes Visuais de Nova York e diretora executiva da Fundação George Nelson, além de membro do Conselho do Arco Futuro. Karen, por favor. André Corrêa do Lago é embaixador, economista e crítico de arquitetura, além de diretor do Departamento de Meio Ambiente e Temas Especiais do Ministério das Relações Exteriores. É membro do Comitê de Arquitetura e Design do MoMA, em Nova York, da Fundação Oscar Niemeyer e do Conselho do Arco Futuro. Por favor, quem quiser dirigir perguntas, pedimos que as encaminhem por escrito aos nossos e às nossas recepcionistas. Obrigado. I have to ask um, a question to um, Raphael. Um, you said, among other provocative things, that um, in the face of the presentations this morning, uh, which were indeed impressive, you thought that architecture is irrelevant. Um, and knowing you a bit, I think, you'll, maybe you'll correct me, that you say that somewhat in jest. No, Raphael. Okay. That you say that somewhat in jest and somewhat in, in complete seriousness. Um, I think it's very possible for those of us who are passionate about architecture to overestimate what architects can do. Architects are not magicians. They can't take the place of good public policy, good economic policy, good social policy. On the other hand, um, architecture is not, as you said yourself, just the making of beautiful objects. It's about reflecting our social values and perhaps, in, in the best of times, encouraging changes in social behavior. So with that said, um, I was imagining that during this morning's presentation when you both were looking at these incredible sites, um, the incredible scale of the sites, um, the incredible magnitude of what they propose, that you couldn't help but have some fantasies of the kinds of projects you would do there. Is that? No, but you, I think you, you caught the drift very clearly. I mean, I think that I, I still work at this because I think that number one is incredibly important. Number two, I think it's incredibly difficult. Um, something for which you have to be fit, because it's one of the most horrible professions in the world. Um, but something that I think needs to be redefined, and perhaps my more combative way of expressing it, is because I think that there are, every architecture, the worst architecture is as important as the best architecture. Because I think that architecture is the only media you cannot turn off. If you don't want to go to a concert, you don't need to go to a concert. If you don't want to read a book, you don't read a book. These things you cannot turn off. Even if you are blind, you cannot turn them off. And I think that they can produce an enormous amount of damage to your brain, to the social consciousness, to the country, to the, to the landscape, to many things. At the same time, they can do these things which are absolutely magical. The problem is that that magic never really happened by not engaging in the public discourse, which is something that I think we collectively as a discipline have adopted. A position of here I am, I'm this person that can actually do something and then you come and I act. When in reality, if it wasn't for your father and his conversations with Kubitschek, this thing wouldn't have happened. These people had a political activity, which I think is essentially a design activity. And that's the that's part that most of us in, educated in the 60s got completely wrong. 
we thought, I come from Uruguay, the inventor of urban guerrilla, right? Before Che Guevara. The Tupamaros are, were people with a great sense of humor that wanted to rob banks and do things, and most of them were architects. In Uruguay, practically everybody is an architect, by the way. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that that's not what the dimension of the profession is. And if you see on one indicator alone, when I went to school, the definition of an architect, and this is not that far in the prehistory, this is in 1965, right? Um, when I went to school, the definition of the role of an architect was to be the owner's representative. <laughs> and now there is a whole profession that is called owner's representative that is fundamentally opposed to the architect. And I believe for a very good reason. Because it, uh, we have consultants for every single thing that we were supposed to know and we don't know, like structure, you know, environmental systems, um, landscape architecture, um, a whole host of things. I mean, I once was forced by a client to hire a consultant in color, a person that could actually tell me what color the <laughs> thing was going to be, and a bullshitter the size of this room, and so are the others too. So my point is that I think that the decay of the profession is the, the decay of the assumption that this is not a joke, that this is unbelievably crucially important for which you have to have some skills. This is the only, sorry, I'm gonna go on forever with this thing, but it's the, it's the only profession, the only profession, the only liberal profession where some of the leaders of the profession have never built. You cannot be a professor of neurosurgery in any university, in any school of medicine, if you don't know how to operate a person in the brain. And I think that there is another component to this, which is also very much a la mode, which is this idea, and I have a theory for that too, which is this idea of the uh, experimentation. And I'm all for experimentation, but if you go back to my preferred discipline, which is the sciences, you can't experiment if you don't know the basics of the science. You go into experimentation when you are, guess what, a graduate student. You're a graduate student, you then apply to enter into a laboratory where a guy, that you follow and that almost knows more than you presents problems to you that you can start investigating on. But if you don't know how to mix two things in a, in a test tube, you can't experiment. Now, that sounds a little bit reactionary. I do believe that it's important, though. You were shaking your head at some point during what he was saying. I was thinking, eu vou falar português. Eu não sei falar inglês. Posso falar português? Pode falar. É, você tem? Sabe por quê? Porque em inglês é difícil o raciocínio e eu quero me dirigir a essa garotada que está aí. Entende? Eu acho essa coisa de arquitetura, quer dizer, eu quando fui estudar arquitetura, eu queria ter uma turma legal. Eu não queria nem ser arquiteta, nem coisa nenhuma. Depois eu gostei muito. Achei ótimo. Agora, eu acho que arquiteto é, tem que botar o pé no chão, entende? E, ao mesmo tempo, ser capaz de dialogar. Entende? Porque arquiteto falando sozinho não interessa. Você entende? Quer dizer, é importante essa coisa da troca. Seja em que nível for. Quer dizer, no nível que ele falou, por exemplo, que eu achei extremamente interessante, você pega um lugar... E você tem uma ideia que incorpora aquele lugar de uma outra forma a uma vida de uma cidade. É uma coisa de uma escala muito bacana, uma coisa importante. Agora, vamos baixar a bola e chegar para um projeto de casa, que é uma coisa mais simples. Não é? Uma casa, por exemplo, uma casa para um cliente, não é? uma casa ela não é um preta a porter Você não compra pronto, então você compra um apartamento. Você faz uma casa... 
Ou você tem um diálogo bom com o dono da casa para você poder fazer o que ele gosta e ele fazer o que você gosta, ou então não faça. Entende? Não faça, porque é cruel. Entende? Agora, eu acho que a arquitetura é isso. Quer dizer, a gente tem um, um poder desperdiçado, como já alguém já disse hoje aqui, porque a gente aprende a lidar com as três dimensões, né? a gente aprende a lidar com o espaço, a gente, e a gente vive dentro do espaço, do espaço da casa e do espaço da cidade, que é a continuação da casa. Né? Então, realmente, se os arquitetos, primeiro, eles, arquitetos, ficarem mais, nós, aliás, perdão, <risos> ficarem mais pé no chão, menos, porque você consegue coisas muito interessantes. Eu fiz um trabalho curioso numa universidade regional no sertão aqui no Brasil. E de repente você descobre às vezes pequenas coisas que geram o que ele fez em escala enorme, entende? Eu acho que é uma coisa assim. E a última coisa que eu gostaria de dizer para as crianças é o seguinte, você antes, se você um dia tiver uma oportunidade de fazer um banquete, é uma maravilha. Mas, antes do banquete, você tem que saber fazer o trivial fino, entende? Então, ninguém nasce gênio e nem precisa ser gênio. Tem que fazer comida boa de comer todo dia, na minha opinião. Só isso. O, o, Maria Elisa, você uh, falou uh, da, da importância da espontaneidade e o, e o Rafael levantou essa bola. Uh, mas há uma diferença muito grande entre a espontaneidade e uma outra questão que você levantou, que é o, o excesso de intuição assim, sem, lastro. sem lastro, a questão da ciência e a questão do conhecimento e da experiência. Como equilibrar estas coisas? Quer dizer, está todo mundo aqui querendo saber, vocês resolverem a vida deles e tal. Como é que vocês lidaram com esse equilíbrio? Porque a, 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 o que eu acho que o, os três projetos que o Rafael mostrou, o Rafael mostrou três projetos exatamente dentro do tema desse Arco Futuro. Né? Só que o Rafael tem os, os, qualquer tipo de projeto, você pode perguntar para ele, ele já fez desde as casas, apartamentos, centros extraordinários, gigantescos, coisa menor. Mas esse equilíbrio dá para, de certa forma, ensinar? Como é que você lida com isso, por exemplo, com as pessoas que trabalham com você, essa questão da espontaneidade, do excesso de, de confiança na intuição, do esforço e, no fundo, da dimensão mais do conhecimento mais próximo da ciência? Well, There is something that is uh, completely um, uh, a matter of fact, which is that this is a, a collective practice. I mean, you know, there, there's absolutely no way um, you can do a building by your own, on your own. Um, totally different than, you know, what happened to Brahms, right? So He would sit down and grab a piece of paper and a pencil and a little piano and did his thing. Cost nothing. The piano probably was gifted. The pencil was less than an apple. And he produced these things. Just tell me how you translate that into architecture. It's just that process, the production process, what the all Marxist used to define as a mechanism of production and distribution. You can build these things if you think you're doing them alone. But the most interesting part of your question is how do you establish a balance between intuition, um, a sense of freedom and uh, reliance on spontaneity, um, a good sense of uh, 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 self-criticism, and realism relative to the most important thing, which I believe is to get it built. I do think that, you know, for many, many years, uh, many years are like 25, for instance, um, architects that build were considered to be, you know, spurious um, uh, sort of mercenaries. 
um, this is also a profession that is form is part of the most seen from your perspective one of the most um, depleting activities in humankind which is essentially we are the source of the environmental disaster in great proportion it's not the car or mr rockefeller but we are part of that we live thanks to that so sort of all of those issues at least in my personal experience come about every morning and i have absolutely no idea what to do honestly i don't and it is a a kind of thing that you need to the minute you think you know how to deal with all of that i think that you became stale and to a certain extent unproductive and i have i usually show kind of projects that i'm proud of i've done 200 which i would rather have somebody else being the author of um <laughs> And that, that thing, the ability to really position yourself in the culture, in the profession, in the industry, is a political gesture. It's a hundred percent pure politics. It's nothing other than that. It's what you do, right? I mean, you know, we know we have to achieve something, but we also have responsibilities to it which imply that you have to have something that effectively doesn't, has also been obliterated from the profession, which is a sense of, a sense of ethics. I once um, talked to um, Robert De Niro when he was the head of the Actors Guild many years ago, and he gave me a piece of statistics which I think is really absolutely frightening for anybody that wants to be an actor. In Hollywood, at that time, this is 20 years ago, there were, or 15, there were 18,500 applicants that could perfectly well fulfill a vacancy in a movie. That's the ratio. So 18,000 actors that could do this job, right? Architecture is not far from that. I mean, there are, 10,000 people, right? Maybe 5,000 people, maybe 300 people per job. If you, if you translate this thing into the attitude of transforming this, which is a passion, into a profession, which is essentially a way of making a living, you have to have some sense of ethics to practice it, and those are also disappear. So it's not just the technology, the, your own internal argument with yourself thinking, what do I do next? I mean, did I do it right? I mean, am I becoming right, inevitably old and finished? Or should I talk to somebody else and see where we can go? It's also the fact that you need to have a position. And that's the reason why I think this country has, like China does, an extraordinary opportunity. Because the work to be done is not 300 to one, it's one per 300. In other words, there are, each architect, if things move the proper way, you all are gonna have work if this country continues going the way it should be going. And that's an absolutely marvelous thing. Nothing, since the Renaissance, nothing happens as a result of a bunch of secular, completely secluded, mafia-type groups. They only happen if there is this influx of new people coming into a profession that are prepared to absorb it, and then they have the possibility of getting a job. Pretty important, the job part. Before I, I get the first question that is quite linked to that, um, I think it's very, since you mentioned Brahms and you mentioned China, uh, and uh, to have numbers in the line of what you were saying. Uh, it's a parenthesis, but you know how many Chinese are studying seriously piano? Yes. 20 million? Yes. 
Yeah. Now, so, <laughs> how could it not? This is always what I say. How could you not get a genius out of Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Really yeah. And how are we going to go to a concert without yes. the Chinese? Yes. But can I just years, ask so. another question related yeah. to the issue of spontaneity, which I think is really fascinating. When I studied Brasilia in architecture school, we studied Brasilia as the creation of an architectural masterwork, a series of incredible buildings. And one of the things that I, I didn't really understand until I came here, and I think that Maria Lisa made very strong point of, is the degree to which the spontaneity of the project made the whole project possible. That if it was something to be done over 20 years, it never would have happened. But it happened because of a particular time, a particular uh, pressure. And when you study architecture, you study it without that context. You don't know, at least in the United States, it, when I studied it, you studied it as if how much time you had, what the political pressures were, were, were irrelevant to the making of those forms. But essentially, they're, they're relevant to it. And the reason I raise that is if you're talking about recovering mine lands, which are are, are projects that have evolved over 40, 50 years. These are long-term infrastructural planning projects. Any of the major issues that are great opportunities here are much are very long-term planning projects. So how do you take the incredible energy um, of, of the spontaneity and, and, and put it together with the long-term issues that have to be addressed? Brasilia. Brasília, uh, eu vou falar português, tá? Eu não consigo me expressar em inglês, eu fico gaguejando. Brasília, eu tenho uma experiência de Brasília curiosa, porque eu vivi a época de Brasília quando eu era vocês. Assim, eu estava na faculdade, terceiro ano de arquitetura, João Gilberto lançou Chega de Saudade, todo mundo feliz da vida, entendeu? E o Juscelino... É uma pessoa que eu tenho uma tese, eu acho que ele só teve coragem de fazer Brasília porque ele nasceu em Diamantina. Porque Diamantina é uma cidade linda, longe de tudo, e que tem uma ligação fortíssima com a beleza. Não é? Então, eu acho incrível, porque eu duvido, se Juscelino tivesse nascido no Rio, em São Paulo, se ele ia ter coragem, sinceramente, de mudar para um lugar que era nada. Porque vocês não têm ideia, quando eu era pequena, no colégio, a gente desenhava o um mapa do Brasil, aí tinha um retângulo tracejadinho assim, escrito, futuro Distrito Federal. Entende? Então, eu acho que o Juscelino percebeu, intuiu, como bom mineiro que é, essa coisa que o Brasil precisava, naquele momento, de fazer uma coisa maior. E aí, como essa, esse lugar era menosprezado, não tinha nada, não houve interferência de interesses imobiliários de nenhuma espécie. E isso foi um estudante que me disse, eu achei uma delícia, porque eu estava comentando com ele que tinha sido extraordinário fazer em tão pouco tempo a cidade. Ele só foi possível porque foi em pouco tempo. Você entende? Quer dizer, ele, ele inverteu... E aí tem o Darcy Ribeiro, né? aquela maravilha que o Darcy Ribeiro, antropólogo, ele fez uma declaração no dia do lançamento da pedra fundamental do espaço Lúcio Costa, meio-dia, na Praça dos Três Poderes. Ele vira-se e diz assim, Deus estava certamente de bom humor quando juntou no mesmo lugar e no mesmo momento Juscelino, Jael Pinheiro, Lúcio e Oscar. Eu acho que é isso. I think that Karen's point is very interesting too because I, it's hard to believe that spontaneity, which is usually three years to construct. No, I know, but that's so the the spontaneity is a is a is a quick reaction. It's not the same than intuition. It's just basically a gestural thing, right? So I mean you you basically are surprised by the way in which you end up putting things together. That is really very challenging a notion if you had to go through 20 years of permit processes. Yes. And I do believe that it's almost impossible. It's already impossible when you think of it in architectural terms, since, as I said before, this number that I used before is not <clears throat> without verification. The average 
completion time of a project since its inception in America is around between seven and 10 years. In Europe, it's more like 15 or so. So you, you, now, if you add to this the cycle, if you put this thing in the cycle of fashion, in which every idea gets consumed in the next 24 hours, then you have to get bored when you see it seven years later, right? Because it's just pure surface. And I think that that is a very important thing, technically speaking, the ability to respect the original move is the only reason why architects exist. You, you, it's a, it's a, if you know this profession, you know how to recognize when the inexplicable appears and you need to know how to defend it through it and because it's a long defense. Eu tenho aqui três perguntas, aliás, excelentes. Uh, a primeira está muito ligada ao que você comentou antes, uh, Rafael, que foi uh, que é, é o teu projeto Tóquio Fórum. Como é que foi numa cultura com hábitos e uh, tradições uh, tão diferentes, sobretudo com relação a nós latinos, como é que foi esse processo, como é que você uh, levou isso uhum. adiante e, obviamente, o público aproveita para dizer que o projeto é fantástico. It actually is a, it, it was a, the result of many sort of spurious circumstances. First of all, that was the only job I had. So, <clears throat> very, very sort of uh, embarrassing um, circumstances, like the one that the, that was the only job I had. I didn't have any other job. So, I mean, if they would have asked me to walk to Tokyo, probably I would have and swam and everything. Um, but, the, but there was something there uh, also. Of a, you see, when you, talking to a friend of ours there, can't see you now. Um, to one of the best parts of American culture is the fact that kids live home when they are 17. And I come from a Hispanic tradition in which you, if it was up to my parents, I probably would be with them still, right? <laughs> and that's a kiss of death, simply put. So if you extend that thing, the ability to really become a permanent immigrant, which is what I have become, is a, is a very dangerous territory, but I want when you inevitably have to know um, how to move, or where you can move, or what you can do and can't do. And, and you're in constant evaluation. When I first got to New York, I couldn't realize whether people were insulting me or not, or thanking me. I couldn't understand what they were talking about. So, so you put this face and you say, well, let's wait for another 10 minutes or another bit of information comes in and you know how to react. That develops a technique which is very similar to the one that you develop living with inflation. If you live with inflation, that destroys your mind. I mean, there's absolutely no way a person that it is normal can actually go through 15 years as I went through of living in Argentina with an inflation that, I mean, every peso that I made, I lost it twice <laughs> the day afterwards, and it was always like that, as I always say, sort of like these people that are, yeah, it's completely yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> So just for the sake of finding something positive about that, I think that it, 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 um, it, it teaches you how to recognize danger. When I went to Japan, um, uh, Kenzo Tange that had organized the competition, <clears throat> had organized the competition through the UIA, which is a very strict, super ethical, international organization of architects, um, which is not very used, uh, very much uh, used now by clients, 
basically because it's too serious. And they do things the proper way, say. <clears throat> um, so it was an open competition. We won it. I went there, and the first thing that happened was that I realized that Tange had actually organized this competition. Tange San had organized this competition this way because he didn't want Isosaki to build in his site. The Tokyo Forum was built in the first site that Tange built in Tokyo. At that time, he was 87 or 88, uh, an absolutely brilliant man. Uh, I think one of the greatest architectures, architects of the century, too. Um, and um, so there was this, uh, what the Japanese call kereitsu. You, there must be somebody here that speaks the language, which is this understanding that is not written anywhere. Uh, and it was that the project was too big, not for me, for anybody that wasn't Japanese. And so they put a, um, a, uh, a condition that you had to be a registered architect, a Japanese registered architect, and you had to take the exams and everything. And um, that's, the, that's the moment where I learned how great archaeological excavations are, because that gave me, gave me a lapse of two years. <laughs> and in these two years, I became a Japanese architect with a translator next to me giving exams about the whole thing. And then I decided, so then I was an architect, they had to give me the job. And then I went out and tried to form an office. And I had two Japanese architects in the office in New York that I had transported back to Tokyo. But we were three and the job needed 85 or 100 or something like that. And I put an ad in the paper. And the ad in the paper returned literally zero. There was zero applicants. And then I said, well, how could it be zero? I mean, it could be two or five or something, but <laughs> zero? And it was because of this long life, lifetime employment mechanism. And so I went in my ways, tried to find some other people, couldn't find anybody. And then a person from the construction company, always the builders are the most wonderful people in the world because they've seen it all. This guy said, you know, I think that what you need to do is to go to a women's school. And in Japan, there are such things. There are universities of women only. And I went to a university. There is a Tokyo University for women. And I put an ad in the architectural school, and I populated the office. The office was 95% women, which was delightful, and myself and a couple of other people, and they were unbelievable. It was such a shock that the television came and filmed this thing, and the construction company had to go up and hire women to move machinery and so on, because it was like, and then there was this enormous uh, uh, gaining of respect, which I, for one, think is, I mean, if it takes you three years to go through it, you should, because it's absolutely wonderful. Tough as they are, once they bought on you, you just, God. And, uh, uh, there are other questions about your projects. Um deles, aí eu acho que a gente vai mudar um pouco de assunto, mas que é um assunto muito próximo do Brasil agora. Como você sabe, o Brasil vai fazer, vai ter a Copa do Mundo, vai ter os Jogos Olímpicos, e uma das coisas que os brasileiros mais reclamam na infraestrutura brasileira são os aeroportos. Você acabou de fazer um aeroporto em Montevidéu, que é uma cidade média, pequena, para padrão pequena, né, atual, pequena. 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 Ah, e que é um aeroporto, que consegue ser um aeroporto, aqui como descrevem aqui, um aeroporto extraordinariamente marcante, arquitetonicamente, e, ao mesmo tempo, não é um projeto caríssimo, porque ele não podia ser caro para... Como é que é essa experiência, inclusive essa coisa que você mencionou dos tempos? 
Como foram os tempos para você fazer isso? Porque isso, para todos nós, é do maior interesse, como diz aqui well, uh, uma the, pergunta. The time, the time span for the construction did not have the pressure did not have the pressure that uh, the government has now because if this was built in in England you would need an extra 15 years to to build infrastructure and pretty much like Brasilia you're going to build it probably in two and a half hours or so <laughs> the <clears throat> the important thing for me in 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 this subject is that you need not you. I mean, I think that the approach that I would take is to have an idea once again that it is in, since you mentioned the airports and, uh, I mean, I know stadiums are a lot more complicated and difficult, but equally uh, predetermined. In my view, the problem with the architecture of airports is that it has been dominated by the imagery that Renzo Piano created in, in, um, Kansai. in Kansai. And since that moment to now, all of these are variations on that theme. And that's done in Japan in a place where you can ask for a stainless steel rod that doesn't flex, that goes from here to where the control room is. And you know these type of things, in, which are absolutely magnificent. And, and if you look at, say, for instance, the airport in New York, which I think is an embarrassment, is a um, well compared to the uh, the airport in Sao Paulo. I, I must say, I love this airport. This is the best. This is the best, the best airport. I think this airport is fantastic. I asked my friend, the driver. Tell me when it's absolutely extraordinary. É o melhor, o melhor projeto de aeroporto no Brasil. Ah, this this is a common, com, huh? fantastic building. Now you can't build that thing in six months or something like that. So I think that there are a number of ideas. Particularly, I have my hopes on. I mentioned this to you before, in um, in the airport um, in Brasilia, because I think that's. Perhaps it's a small airport, but it is an absolutely iconic point of, of what's going to happen to it. And uh, I think that the climatic conditions in the area and also the complexity of the existing plan lends itself to a number of very interesting ideas that I myself, I remember it very well because I used to, well, I went to visit you once there and before. and. Um, it, it could be an, 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 so for me, the answer to the question is, I think pretty much like the Brits do out of arrogance, which is wonderful, right? Because, you know, they're so self-assured that they throw the, the queen right in a, in a parachute from, I mean, you know, it's just whatever. You have to buy it because, you know, they're Britain, right? But the uh, infrastructure, I don't know if you've seen it, but the infrastructure was incredibly simple and totally practical and, you know, unassuming and incredibly effective. And I think that what should happen in a circumstance like this, not just because of the time, but also because of what you said before, these things should just happen. I mean, it's not, it's not, that, it's not like in China that you're going to kill yourself if you don't have a perfectly well-organized uh, opening ceremony, and they probably killed a couple of people that were <laughs> drumming at a different rhythm or something. But uh, it, it has to be something natural, right? And, in, otherwise, in, it doesn't happen. And otherwise, it doesn't happen. And so that is, once again, the opening of a new vocabulary for this country in the same way in which concrete was in the 40s. This didn't happen because I mean. It was... Interesse, como diz aqui, well, uh, the, uma pergunta. The time, the time span for the construction did not have the pressure, did not have the pressure that uh, the government has now. Because if this was built in in England, you would need an extra 15 years to to build infrastructure, and pretty much like Brasilia, you're going to build it probably 
in two and a half hours or so. The, <clears throat> the important thing for me in, in, in this subject is that you need, not you, I mean, I think that the approach that I would take is to have an idea once again that it is in, since you mentioned the airports and uh, I mean, I know stadiums are a lot more complicated and difficult, but equally uh, predetermined. In my view, the problem with the architecture of airports is that it has been dominated by the imagery that Renzo Piano created in, in, um, Kansai. in Kansai. And since that moment to now, all of these are variations on that theme. And that's done in Japan in a place where you can ask for a stainless steel rod that doesn't flex, that goes from here to where the control room is. And you know, these type of things in, which are absolutely magnificent. And, and if you look at, say for instance, the airport in New York, which I think is an embarrassment, is a... Um, well, compared to the, uh, the airport in Sao Paulo, I, I must say, I love this airport. This is the this best, is the best, the best airport. I think this airport is fantastic. I asked my friend, the driver, tell me when. It's absolutely extraordinary. This is a common, com huh? fantastic building. Now, you can't build that thing in six months or something like that. So I think that there are a number of ideas, particularly I have my hopes on, I mentioned this to you before, in, um, in the airport um, in Brasilia, because I think that's perhaps, a, it's a small airport, but it is an absolutely iconic point of, of what's gonna happen to it. And uh, I think that the climatic conditions in the area and also the complexity of the existing plan lends itself to a number of very interesting ideas that I myself, I remember it very well because I used to, well, I went to visit you once there and before. And um, it, it could be an, 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 so for me, the answer to the question is, I think pretty much like the Brits do out of arrogance, which is wonderful, right? Because, you know, they're so self-assured that they throw the, ki the queen right in a, in a parachute from, I mean, you know, it's just whatever. You have to buy it because, you know, they're Britain, right? But the uh, infrastructure, I don't know if you've seen it, but the infrastructure was incredibly simple and totally practical and you know, unassuming and incredibly effective. And I think that what should happen in a circumstance like this, not just because of the time, but also because of what you said before, these things should just happen. I mean, it's not, it's not, that, it's not like in China that you're gonna kill yourself if you don't have a perfectly well-organized uh, opening ceremony. And they probably killed a couple of people that were <laughs> drumming at a different rhythm or something, but, uh, it has to be something natural, right? And, 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 otherwise, it doesn't and otherwise it doesn't happen. And so that is, once again, the opening of a new vocabulary for this country in the same way in which concrete was in the 40s. This didn't happen because, I mean, it was a cheap material. As a matter of fact, it was the only material, right? And, and so see what happens, right? I mean, I remember this is an embarrassment too many years ago. Many years ago, I came, it was the only other time that the Brazilians invited me for something. And I, uh, I came f to a conference of public housing in Sao Paulo, a horrendous place. I mean, on, and I, I always loved public housing and so I came to see what happened and so on. The only problem in the whole organization of the Congress was that Saha was invited to, and she wasn't the queen yet. <laughs> but she had all the makings of the queen, so the first thing she did was to complain about the hotel and got irritated and all of that. And I said, well, let me just take you to see what you really want to build 
built 35 years ago. And it was a fascinating thing because, you know, think for a minute. This, this stuff that your father did is what? 70 years old, more or less, 60 years old. In Brazil, he I mean, was everywhere. People. I mean, the work of the Roberto. But all he of this had stuff. a luggage, a cultural luggage, and he was moved by reality. My no, my, but, but what I'm trying to tell you is that all of that is on the positive side. What it is surprising uh, is that in the meantime, Corbusier was talking, right, <laughs> and stealing the work from the con everybody. Yeah, from everybody. Right? And, you know, that's the only name you know, right? And these guys were actually building it. If you need a plan for that, you're dead. You just have to be spontaneous, no? Yeah. Yeah. Now, it, I, yeah. I have to say something else because I think that it's a very important thing. I think that I have always had in, in my heart the hope to see modern architecture old. <laughs> because <laughs> everything... Everything that it is old, at least in the places in which I mostly work, some are really old, like for instance, I did the new master plan and a couple of buildings in Oxford University, and that's truly old, it's 1100s, 1200s. In Princeton, it's 1940, and they think it's old because it looks old. And there's this thing about being old that makes you kind of significant. I think that's a total disaster. I mean, the, the, the vacancy and the critical capacity to identify things in architecture that are old and bad is remarkable. I mean, you know, you can't know if it is old, it's good, and that's yeah. it. And it, it, oh, well, exactly right. And so now think of it. When architecture gets old, it gets sanctified, right? Beatified. So it, it goes into, the Pope names it, right? Brasilia is old. And it is a thousand times better than when it was new. And I think that this, this capacity of the place to regenerate itself is in the design. It's not outside of the, so the, the idea of the open field, that many people confused with the ideas of the radial city and stuff like that. I mean, they didn't understand the first thing. It's an occupational move. You were taking the jungle into with the more amount of, the, with the largest amount of buildings possible and large open spaces that have become used in places in which I am sure that none of you guys, I mean, really predicted that they could be. Now, that, that, that's a remarkable thing. Uh, something that very few people is 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 Brasilia in the register of the. Of the next, yes. It is since when. Was there one thing? Brasilia was an anchor, ma ancora. Ancora. Que o Juscelino jogou no meio do cerrado. O que aconteceria depois? Ninguém podia nem imaginar, entendeu? Sabia se que ia, quer dizer, então. Uma coisa que eu acho importante que se diga é que o que houve de inovador em Brasília foi o projeto. O resto é rigorosamente tradição brasileira. Yeah, but you remember... a, a expansão em volta, pobre mora longe, aquelas coisas que a gente conhece. Né? E meu pai dizia sempre assim, não, é porque Brasília é a capital do Brasil, ela não é a capital da Suécia, entende? Isso é básico. Entendeu? Quer dizer, isso eu acho importante. E outra coisa que eu queria passar para os meninos rapidinho é a recomendação mais importante em termos profissionais que eu ouvi do meu pai, era o seguinte, a gente viajando, qualquer coisa, ele dizia assim, olha, repara, presta atenção. Uhum. Aliás, em Brasília tem uma outra característica que é muito interessante, já pegando um pouco o que a Maria Elisa falou, Uh, que, é, que é uma capital do país, ela é muito mais a capital do, Brasil, do, país, do país que o Brasil é hoje do que a capital do país que o Brasil era em 1956. Não, era uma é uma projeção 
do que se achava que o Brasil poderia uma ser. Vontade, Era uma vontade certeza, que o Brasil fosse. Outra. Exatamente. E acabou sendo, que é uma coisa... Bom, tem uma outra pergunta aqui, já que você falou de social housing. Tem aqui uma outra pergunta do Pedro sobre uh, como é que evoluiu uh, o teu uh, housing complex lá em Buenos Aires. Hum. Uh, é, Rioja? Não estou conseguindo ler bem. Hum. Como é que I evoluiu em alguns anos? My demolished work. I mean, you know, it's a, that's so old that it's... A, Well, it's self-demolished because of, uh, of another, another significant illness of Latin America, which is that we don't understand maintenance. We don't know what it is. I mean, you know, we, we just think that we build it and it will be like this forever and nobody spends a penny in trying to repaint it or maintain it. Um, That project is a, uh, I, I mean, I think it, it was, a, do you know it? You've never seen it, I right? I've just seen drawings. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's built, it's built, I mean, a big piece. I mean, it was supposed to be 10,000 units, uh, ended up being something like five or six. And it was this idea that, um, it, it, fundamentally, that it could be uh, pretty much influenced by the Smithsons and, And, uh, and these notions of, uh, of uh, uh, creating collective agrupations that, that could actually be more understood. So the larger complex was divided initially in 20 neighborhoods, and these neighborhoods then in sub-neighborhoods. And that was all responded perhaps too, too obsessively not perhaps, for sure, too obsessively, um, by one form that adapted and uh, adapted to all of these different scales. And the only virtue that it had was that it was prefabricated. Now, in retrospect, um, I don't think the prefabrication was enough of an excuse for that. Parts of it are very present even, even now, but uh, uh, I think it's one of these things that happened in the late 60s, early 70s that are borderline. Okay. Um, Karen, I'm, uh, eu vou fazer um outro comentário aqui, que é o, é o seguinte. Você mostrou dois projetos em cidades que foram vítima de uma mudança econômica absolutamente brutal. Bom, ao mesmo tempo, as cidades uh, são o futuro, porque o, o crescimento da população mundial irá, de qualquer maneira, para as cidades. Países como o Brasil são mais de 83% ur urbanos. Uh, um, a China já ultrapassou 50%, vai ser muito mais. E a América Latina vai ser o lugar mais urbanizado do mundo no futuro, com 95% da população urbana. Então, esse, esse desafio que eu acho que foi muito interessante você mostrar para a gente, de como re, contribuir para reinventar uma cidade. Ah, e isso está muito ligado a um outro tema que você levantou, que é raro que as pessoas levantem, mas que é uma das questões-chave para justamente a gente poder hum, viver hum. todos juntos aqui, que é a mudança dos padrões de consumo, a mudança do lifestyle. Como é que você sente a resistência ou a surpresa dessas comunidades quando você aborda essas questões tão ligadas à vida da cidade? Eu acho que o problema com o planejamento é que é uma disciplina que que Uh, has always tried to become uh, more or less uh, measurable. And the indicators are, uh, are really very, just now that we have tools to understand exactly how things work. So the intellectual instrument that the planners have always had is very mu much ideologically based. For instance, this project I just mentioned before, the idea of the neighborhood is pretty much ingrained on something, which I'm not so sure that is healthy from, from a social, so sociological perspective. Um, 
So I think that two things in answer to that. First is that I think that the ability of the public to understand change is much larger than you and I and most people in the business really understand or are prepared to take. And number two, I think that the, the capacity to really retrieve from a design-driven approach. You've seen this, you've seen these projects in Abu Dhabi and places like that, which are new cities. They're all either a square or a circle, right? And it, to a certain extent, it's justifiable, is it? Desert, right? But it could be something else too, right? And I think that there's something else usually may not result in an architectural commission, which is one of the reasons why I think the profession is still prepared to that. Because I think that if you take the subject of, uh, of, uh, of density and you try to really understand the models of how we have achieved density in historic centers or in tabula rasa centers in Houston, for instance, and stuff. It's all based on one building model, right? It's the tower, right? Now, I, I was in Shanghai talking to um, some people there that um, are in the government. And, and, you know, in places like this, you can create districts where the experimentation, the true experimentation of changing the patterns of space occupation, right? There are two models. The, the, the carpet and the sticks, right? And this is, this is practically all there is. And the sticks appear, the sticks meaning the columns, right? The high-rise buildings. And when you think of it, there are lots of cities which are only carpets and only one city that is all sticks, which is Manhattan. And in between, there is nothing. The only thing there is is people that know that they're going to lose some business and try to make density at the expense of the old city and generating an enormous amount of cultural friction and so on. I think that the, there is a design issue. And by that, I, I do think it's 100% pure architecture. There must be something else to create density rather than planting the high rises on the carpet. And I think that that goes back to the one thing that I think is absolutely fundamental. There is a show. Have you seen the show on the grid, on the Museum yeah. of the City? Yeah. So the grid, the grid in Manhattan is the best planning move in the history of mankind. And it is the stupidest one at the same time. It, it's that, that part is fascinating. You think it's the most obvious thing in the world. And, and it yet, isn't. And yet it seems so incredibly subtle and genius. Unbelievable. I mean, it's long and short. Short, low. Short, tall. Low, low. Right? The long, the long side of the block is low scale. The head is tall. Between tall, there is an avenue. And the other one, there is a street. That's it. Now, that created this amazing thing. The other part to that, which is probably the less visual of them all, definitely, well, it's the less visual because people don't want to go underground, is what these guys in the 19th century and the 18th century built under this island, which is an infrastructure with the technology they had, which was masonry and wood, that lasted 200 years and still carries the city. Yeah, no, because in a way you realize that one of the biggest accomplishments of New York is the water supply. That without that water supply... And, and if you visit those, are the most wonderful spaces in the world. There's no one single architect that can actually, Piranesi maybe, emulate these places, right? Or, or this insistence in infrastructure, the multiplicity. Where have you seen a city that has every four blocks a bridge 
that costs a couple of billion dollars, right? So it's a reliance on the effectiveness of density, which I think is what makes that city. That, that's inapplicable, I think, anywhere else in the world. I mean, you see it in Shanghai, and it's yet again another little place of the city stuck there when there are buildings that are 10 times taller than in America and so on. But I think that in places like this, in places where the topography helps you, this possibility of occupying the advantage of the fact that the terrain does that, rather than stretching the carpet upwards and mm -hmm. then complaining, right? Is it, and then the, the carpet goes up, and then at the end, if you're clever, you build two little towers in stucco at the top mm -hmm. to sell it to the people with more money. I mean, there must be some way in which you can take all of this. And it's, that's not utopian. That's a real design problem. It cannot be done through laws or regulations. Somebody has to have an idea. Yeah, but I think one of the issues that you raise about all of that is that it's not the design of the buildings, it's the design of the infrastructure. Totally. So until you, until you figure out how to get water, services, no. transportation, you shouldn't even be... Can I ask you something? Who of our colleagues would be interested in designing... You know what I mean? That's where the problem lies for yeah. us. Is that we think that's for somebody else because it's not flashy or you cannot make it nice picture of it. No, but I think that that's one of the things that's pretty remarkable about the mining territories, is that if you were to say, okay, we know that these places have a lifespan, what, of 50 years, 75 years, what's the typical lifespan? Then what if we were to, and that's during a human lifespan, what if we were to plan those with some kind of infrastructure that might not be used during their life as mines, but were to be used in their next life, but that's what Flavio was telling me before, that it is, I didn't know that existed a closing. Uh, there's, there's a permit for opening the mine, and, and I thought that there was no compromise or commitment to close it, but there is. There is. The problem is that I can stretch the life of the, of the, um, of the mine I never built it, right? So regarding mines, I think that we should just forget iron. Wouldn't that be great? If instead of spending the money in all of this, you give it to the, to the nanoscientists, they'll come up with an iron that you have never believed existed before. As a matter yeah, fact, but what they, about, would, are they going to come up with gold and diamonds as well? They, no, because the people are going to start, because we all are going to create the stupid mechanism of mer, 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 commoditization that is going to make you desire to the end of life, a piece of carbon fiber. And all we need to do is to tell Frank to design it, and <laughs> that would be great, and it would be his job. I'm all for giving the money to the scientists. The, there is a question, a pergunta para você, uh, Marilisa, uh, que nessa, nessa escola aqui, nessa escola Guinhar, Uh, o, o arquiteto uh, convidou artistas para participar uh, no projeto, como Almir de Castro, o Farnese, uh, e, e eles e aqui perguntam para você uh, a importância dessa, desse equilíbrio entre a arte e a arquitetura na, na, uh, no pensamento e na arquitetura do Lúcio Costa. Meu pai nunca separou a arte de arquitetura. Que história é essa? Para ele, a arquitetura é arte. Ele diz que é a arte mais dependente de outras contingências. Não é? Mas nunca deixou de ser. Quer dizer, na hora que você... Ele, ele falava muito de um dito do Corbusier, né? que se você faz uma coisa que funciona, muito bem, muito bem, muito obrigado. Como obrigado ao engenheiro dos caminhos de ferro. Mas, de repente, acontece uma outra coisa. Né? Você me toca de uma outra forma, num outro nível. Quer dizer, isso eu digo a arquitetura. Tá? Aí, por exemplo, se você pensa que no projeto do Ministério da Educação, que ele pilotou, você tem 
o que havia de melhor na, na, de expressões, tanto na, de pintura, de escultura, de tudo, são coisas de um valor individual muito grande, quando essas coisas estão lá, naquele espaço determinado pela arquitetura, elas ganham uma coisa adicional. É como se fosse assim, um instrumento maravilhosamente bem tocado sozinho, mas ali ele faz parte de uma harmonia maior. Quer dizer, eu acho que a, a, a ligação é natural, ela não é uma coisa... Não é preciso fazer força. Eu acho que, se não atrapalhar, dá certo. Entende? Quer dizer, acho mesmo, acho que é uma coisa assim, importante. Não, não tem, a gente não tem que ficar muito, muito mercado, sabe? Eu não aguento mais mercado. Porque o Brasil constrói loucamente e você tem pouquíssima coisa proporcionalmente ao que se constrói com qualidade arquitetônica. E você tem um bando de meninos querendo ser arquiteto. Eu quero que eles sejam bons arquitetos. <risos> e, que, e que haja uma, uma demanda até legal, sei lá, sabe? Para que, que arquiteto seja usado. Né? Entende? Porque, senão, o que, que acontece você hoje? Que, que diferença tem? Teve uma época no Rio de Janeiro que você tinha grandes escritórios de arquitetura. Hoje, você tem as imobiliárias que contratam os meninos que saíram da escola para fazer um quebra-cabeça do código de obras, só e mais nada, entendeu? Isso é grave, porque a gente, é o que ele disse, você vai ter que conviver, não é, não é roupinha que você joga fora, não, vai ficar aquele negócio lá o tempo todo e você tem que conviver com aquilo. Quer dizer, eu acho que a gente tinha que, que levar a sério o espaço urbano, quer dizer, o espaço urbano é uma... Isso meu pai tinha uma coisa também em relação à cidade, que tem a ver com a arquitetura dele, que ele chamava de visadas, sabe? É, é, olhares na cidade. Por exemplo, no Rio, para quem conhece o Rio, você se lembra aquele terreno em frente da garagem, Menezes Cortes, ali no centro da cidade? Existia uma coisa no Rio chamada Conselho de Arquitetura e Urbanismo, que tinha pessoas feras, tinha meu pai, tinha Roberto, etc., e ali estava previsto um tremendo prédio. E ele, Lúcio, conseguiu impedir. Sabe por quê? Porque precisava um desafogo urbano e liberar a visada para o Convento de Santo Antônio. Pode? Entende? Quer dizer, e está lá, e é ótimo que esteja. E a pessoa... Eu vejo o espaço urbano é um espaço tão importante quanto o de dentro da casa da gente. A gente vive ali, ele influencia a vida da gente o tempo todo. Eu acho que é por aí. Uh, eu acho que já está mais ou menos na hora da gente encerrar. Rafael, você quer fazer um comentário um pouco essa coisa da, de como você se integra com artistas e tudo? Como é que é para você isso daí? Eu acho que... This is a uh, problem of uh, nomenclature. And it's a nomenclature that really evolves from a very, uh, <clears throat> from a very specific period in the history of, uh, of uh, art um, that uh, in which the definition of what is artistic and what is inartistic is, is really um, um, attributed to, to fringe operations, right? To operations which were combative and that had a, a sort of, um, <clears throat> a, 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 a sort of romantic idea of what the mission of the artist uh, was. Um, Back to my first argument this afternoon, I also read in this book about Goya that there was a job for him and a job description, that it was the person that was supposed to create in Spanish, it's a little bit more complicated, but it is, it, it, the amusing images for the social rooms in the palace, and he created this things that they were translated into um, weavings and fabric and so on, the originals of which. And then from there he became the portraitist, right? And, and that was not a, uh, 
may have nothing to do with art. I mean, the guy didn't have a cape or, you know, got drunk or shot, uh, uh, you know, cocaine or anything like that. I mean, it was a man that worked, right? And I think that that's, that unifies the whole thing in a way. Um, as I always say, talking to people that I respect enormously in the so-called art world, the problem with artists is when artists claim that they can do architecture, like um, Frank Stella did for some years. <clears throat> huh? It's, yeah, horrific. Yeah, horrific. But the problem is also when the architects want to to sculpture, which is also awful and completely. And I have a couple of um, I have a couple of anecdotes on that which are very telling. I um, Richard Serra, uh, who had um, a great deal of trouble during the uh, late seventies, early eighties, in sort of becoming what he's now, and he's a very angry man, but an extraordinary speaker and a person with a vision of the world that is absolutely un ultra talented, um, said something to me which uh, Anish Kapoor said to me too. He said, why do you guys want to do this? We do it better than you. <laughs> and it's exactly like that. Now, if that's architecture, then there is a mistake, because it is an architecture, is phenomenal art. I mean, the ellipses, which are architectural spaces, mm -hmm. are art. That, that, that doesn't have it. Have you seen a faucet near a, or a, or a water closet, or a, or a switch to turn on the lights or not? I mean, you know, that's, it, it, it is a little bit pedestrian, as an explanation, but I think it, it it hides a very important notion, which is that, at, and this is sort of like what I wanted to say before, that at the end of the day, the evolution of great architectural um, uh, advances has always been as a result of what I call a true architectural idea. If you are Palladio, and yes, Peter might have, or Colin might, might have written 25,000 books about the relationship of one, two, three and a half, and, but what Palladio invented, which I think is a, an absolutely remarkable thing that crosses over his whole production, and that's the reason why he is who he is, is because he invented the notion that you could live in a church. Now just imagine that, right? So the person that elevated dwelling, that, that made dwelling appropriate a typology that belonged to the largest and most important social, economic, and political force in the moment, right? He, that's that's a pol what I call a political move. And it's an absolutely remarkable idea. Everybody thinks that Mies is the result of the, advan uh, the advancement of class technology, or I mean, it's not that. What Mies invented is he redefined the notion of publicness. And that crosses absolutely every single work in brick, in glass, in stone, that he did. He had a position that informed most of your friends on the notion that the public nature of enclosed space could actually be public. So everything that happened after that is the mastery of his innate ability to manage the other part of all of this, which is that if you don't have a sense of proportions, you might as well not even try, which is what these guys have. Because if you go to Brasilia, for many people, you know, walking into the cathedral, many people feel that it's too large or too small. And I happen to believe that it's always just right. 
and and I think that that's that's a innate quality of an architect. But the idea of the architect, the ideas that have produced this, I mean, it's exactly like the Gothic, right? If you want to trend, if you want to bring a sense of elevation and and um, and 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 sense of uh, awe in the perception of space. It's not so much the glass and the vitros and all of that. It's basically the idea that the notion of the connection with heaven somehow could be manifested in the building fabric. These people redefined the use of masonry. It wasn't just because they wanted lots of little thin columns or something like that. I mean, you know, it, it was really something that contained a meaningful transformation of how people perceive the sacred space. And with that, every single important piece of architecture that you see, I mean, just look for me. The first fluid architect, the first fluid architect in the world wasn't Saha Hadid, it was Borromini, right? So kind of, right? So it is that, but, the, but that's a change at that time. At that time, this had changed because everything was sort of the starkness of the geometry and the ability to produce. So to me, this is what I think that if somebody wrote a history of architecture trying to discover those kinds of things that give it, that propelled it forward, you know, in, in many ways, say for instance, you know, what happened to Archigram, right? Archigram invented something that God represented and, and made into a circus and all the rest, but it represented algo, uh, something that it wasn't really available before, which is the notion of, of obsolescence, right? So that you could reduce the lifespan, the lifespan of a building by basically incorporating in it the capacity to be transformed. That's if an enormous architectural idea. It's not physics, it's not financial, it's not sociological, it's nothing other than an architect's idea. I think there are very little of those nowadays. Muchísimo obrigado, Maria Elisa, Rafael e Karen, e obrigadíssimo ao público, e bem-vindos. Vamos fazer agora um intervalo e voltamos às 18 horas para um bate-papo entre Gustavo Pena, Fernando de Melo Franco, Fernando Moreira Salles, Franklin Feder e Andréa Correia do Lago, que falarão sobre os desafios sócios econômicos de áreas mineradas. Obrigado. Pessoal, é, por favor, não esqueçam de preencher o formulário para a retirada do certificado do Arco Futuro Minas Gerais.